Hey, Joel Duff here. Welcome back to the channel. Well, it's been kind of a rough week this past week. I've had to endure watching my social media feed be filled with pictures of friends of mine all enjoying getting together and talking to one another, having meals together, listening to talks and so forth. What were they all doing? They were all participating in the American Scientific Affiliation Meeting. Right? That's a scientific, well, it's a professional society of scientists who also are Christians. And so therefore are talking about issues of science and faith. And I would know many, many people who are at this particular meeting. I wasn't able to attend. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why I was unable to attend uh, in a moment. But bef before I get talking about that, I want to tell you a little bit about scientific meetings and the American Scientific Affiliation in particular. Um, which, as I just said, has this added dimension of being a community of scientists who are also committed Christians, right, coming together to talk about science and faith topics. So as a scientist myself, right, as a professional scientist, I've been to many conferences and I've given many presentations. I've presented as far away as Vienna, Austria and Guatemala City, Guatemala. In fact, that picture right above me there is me speaking at a conference in Guatemala. Um, you might wonder, like, why would scientists fly across the country or around the world to attend these meetings? I mean, the obvious thing that most people come is because they just want a free vacation, right? They just, they, they want a chance to go somewhere and have an excuse, all right, to leave their drab office, right, and to get out into the world. No, it's, it's much more than that, a whole lot more than that, right? So what are scientific conferences, all right? Well, they're kind of the you know, the, the Super Bowl, you know, of science events. So they are big gatherings, people all over the place. And what they're doing is they're sharing their latest findings. They're discussing new ideas and they're connecting, right? It really is about networking in, in a large sense. You know, so staying current is really important in most fields uh, that most scientists are working in, right? Science is moving fast and you need to keep up to date. Um, in my field, often I felt like, you know, going to a, a, a national scientific meeting was kind of like getting a year's worth of scientific journals, all like condensed, right, in, in, these, in those a couple action-packed days. It's also about sharing my work, right? I've done things I need to share the, with the community. So I present my work to experts. You've got to get some feedback. Uh, they also will learn from that. Uh, and... Really, it's kind of your obligation to do that, especially if you're getting, say, federal funding, right? If tax dollars are helping to pay for my research, one of the things that, that I need to do is I need to publish my results, I need to publish the data I've collected to make it available to everybody, but also need to communicate those results to, first and foremost, to the scientific community, but also to the public in some way, right? And then, of course, it's about networking. Right. The scientific meetings are about dinners and lunches and breakfast and hanging out and meeting in between meetings, making those connections, creating new collabor collaborations, because science is highly collaborative, especially in this, this day and age. All right. I'm, it's about getting inspired. I hear new ideas, gets me thinking, gets me reinvigorated right, for the work that I'm doing. So it's inspiring, and I might even learn two new technologies. There's almost always some kind of workshops that are uh, typically like the day before the scientific talk start. You might have a day of workshops. You could sign up for something it's like I need to improve my skills. Yeah, think about it. You know, even though you're, I'm a professor, and but I've been out of college for a long time. You know, it's been a long time since I had to, since I got any specific training. And so scientists would say like, I want to learn about this new technique. Something that, well, there's lots of things that didn't even exist when I was in school and doing my original research. So there's a time to learn new tools. Uh, and of course, there's the field trips. Yeah, and sometimes the field trips can be for fun. A lot of times scientific meetings, you might bring the family with you. Uh, and so they need things to do, but you, know, you might do something together. But you know, also there's usually some kind of scientific field trips. Now, all of these things are going to apply to what I'm going to say about the American Scientific Affiliation meeting that just happened and will be coming up next year, the annual meeting in 2025. And so I've been on a number of field trips at different uh, places. So usually the host city or the host site uh, will arrange a bunch of field trips and you can sign up for those. 
All right, well, let's get to the American Scientific Affiliation, which I'm pointing out here. All right, this was their meeting, which just uh, ended not too long ago. So here, July 26th through the 29th, meeting at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Let me just say a quick word about the American Scientific Affiliation for those of you who are unfamiliar. Um, this organization was founded in 1941 uh, with the mission, I just drew this mission statement off the current ASA website. Uh, the ASA is a scholarly and professional, professional society. We're an international community and fellowship of Christians engaged in the interface of vital science faith questions. So what are the types of things that you would do if you were a member of the American Scientific Affiliation? Well, they have one of the things they do as a society, as an organization, is they put on a annual conference. Uh, there are also local chapters, and so I've been to a local chapter that covers sort of here in Ohio, um, and those would meet periodically, maybe multiple times a year at uh, at times. Um, so, but the annual conference, which is the thing that just ended, is sort of like the big gathering of people across the country and even beyond just the United States. They also have a journal, all right? They have a professional journal. If you're a member of the society, then you're going to receive that particular journal. Uh, and you can you know, read the papers that are in there. Often those are papers that are maybe things that were talked about at the scientific meeting that eventually will be written up in papers and perspectives on science and Christian faith. Um, so those would be the, the primary activities, but um, there's a lot of other outreach things and funding students and you know, there's, there's a bunch of other societal things that go on. Um, now, I'm, I'm pointing out this other thing, key figures in the ASA, and this is really more about like the history of the American Scientific Affiliation. And I'm only showing this because um, the American Scientific Affiliation is a broad evangelical, typically called like a broad tent organization, bringing together um, scientists in all different fields uh, from a variety of different um you know, evangelical backgrounds and allowing them to cross pollinate, right? Cross converse, you know, both on their theological differences, right? And that's the thing is yeah, trying to understand how science and faith interact. So you have to also really grapple with the, uh, the faith questions as well. It's all part of that. Uh, and oh yeah, back to the names here. You see uh, John uh, Whitcomb, Henry Morris, there, they're a couple of the founding members of the American Scientific Affiliation. So that is, it tells you that the original uh, American Scientific Affiliation included what would today we would think of it as like, like you would look at that as being a broader tent, right? Because it included young earth creationists, right? Those are, those are uh, young earth creationists that have been involved in the ASA. Now today, young earth creationists can still be involved in the ASA, but there really aren't many that involve themselves in this particular organization or would go to this particular meeting, right? Young Earth creationists have developed their own societies, like the Creation Research Society, uh, which happened to also have met this past week, um, or yeah, yeah, about a week ago. They also, as a society, meet together as scientists who are Christians and talk about issues of science and faith there as well. So that's kind of a, a fracturing of the ASA or a leaving of a component of those who were involved. Uh, over time. Now, I don't want to say anything more about this right now, but I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been reading about the history of the American Scientific Affiliation, and, and there's some good resources for that. And I'm going to be developing more of a, um, a series in which I'll talk about the history of not just the American Scientific Affiliation, but also other um, scientific uh, societies that are made up of Christians in science. Because the American Scientific Affiliation and Creation Research uh, Society aren't the only ones. But I want to trace some of their histories over the past 75 to 100 years and look at how they have changed. And I'm, I've thought a lot about questions like mission creep, you know, the, the changing vision over time. I want to look at how the vision of some of these organizations has changed, how the composition has changed, what the issues, because that also traces the issues of within the Christian church in terms of its grapplings with uh, science over uh, the past uh, century. All right, so those are all things that I are, are part of a current research project uh, that, I'm, that I'm involved with. And then I will uh, make some videos in order to explore some of my ideas in that area. Uh, but 
back to the ASA and the particular uh, thing that inspired me this week, which is just the fact that I missed this ASA meeting uh, recently. And I said I would talk a little bit about why that is the case. Um, honestly, uh, most of those who were there, I mean, I know there's going to be individuals watching this video that uh, attended the ASA 2024 uh, conference and know me, uh, or at least know me through my YouTube channel, right, uh, and my blog. And they might wonder why I wasn't there. And it's not that I've always been there and I missed this one. No, uh, it's been a long time, like a long time since I've made it to an American Scientific Affiliation meeting. Honestly, I couldn't even remember the, the last one that I've been able to go to. Uh, and so it's something that's missing from, you know, a regular routine of mine. And it's something that I know I just gave you a whole list of like, what are the what are the valuable things about going right? Being able to present myself. But that's really not the most important for me. It would be the networking. It would just be honestly just seeing people that I know maybe just through uh, social media and this particular channel and actually being able to physically be there with somebody and talk to them uh, and enjoy their fellowship. That would be a big deal. And that would be a really important, probably the most important reason uh, for me to be there. Um, it, it would also allow me to make those networking connections. You know, it's not just, you know, friendships, but it would also be, here's the things I'm interested in. You know, here's the things I'm talking about. I'm interested in people know some of the things I'm interested in because maybe they're listening to my, this channel where I kind of, uh, you know, let my mind wander and, and think through topics. All right. In front of a camera. And, um, and so people have seen that and, but that can lead to stimulating discussions, um, and potentially collaborate, you know, collaborations. Uh, cause one of the things, one of the things I am seeking to do is to do some more, uh, academic work. Um, you know, put, put the, put the thoughts to some paper in a, in a more precise way, um, to potentially, you know, publish, uh, material from, from ideas that I've had, uh, that I've been exploring with you on this channel. All right. So those are all great things. It's like, Joel, you've convinced me, you know, I really should be going to this ASA meeting. There's lots of people to meet. Uh, I would learn some things, uh, from the talks, uh, presented. I could go to, the, they have workshops. Right. In which you discuss like maybe a specific issue with people that also have that same interest uh, and they have field trips. Right. So, I mean, it, it's got it all. Why not attend? Um, this year, I have a bit of an excuse. This meeting about overlapped with another commitment I had. Um, and it was another commitment to do a science faith, faith type. Um, I had a science faith interaction opportunity that I really couldn't pass up. Uh, and so I, I agreed to that. In fact, I agreed to that before I really even thought about when the ASA meeting was going to be. That was all fantastic. I wouldn't have given it up um, for this. But because of the close proximity of the dates, uh, it would have made going to ASA very difficult. Um, there's a second reason I didn't attend, but it, but that just is more like it's a good thing. I didn't agree to attend and uh, pay my... Uh, you know, pay my fees because I've had some health issues this summer and I actually would physically have not been able to attend. It turns out I would have had to have canceled, uh, even if I had tried to cram it in there. Um, but there's another really big reason. It's, a, it's an unfortunate reason, but, um, oh yeah, here were the speakers this year. So, I mean, you had Francis Collins there who I've not had a chance to meet and I really would have loved to have gone just, just to meet Francis Collins. Uh, and a lot of other speakers that I know, uh, I certainly would have known maybe a third of all the speakers at all the talks uh, at this uh, particular meeting. Um, but here's here's the big one. And this is just the reality of scientific meetings. This is not I'm not I'm not calling out ASA on this. They have to do this. This this is just what the cost is. This is what it costs to go uh, to these meetings. And I, I, I started with all the valuable things you can get from these meetings because they are worth it, right? Is this not a waste of, of money? Um, I would make enough connections. There'd be a good, a lot of great things uh, would come from that. But for me personally, 
you know, the, the thing with scientific meetings is I've been to, I mentioned in the intro that um, I've been to an international meeting. I've been an, I've spoken at an international meeting for the American, for the Botanical Society, or actually the International Botanical Society in this case. Um, and so went to Vienna, right? That's, that's not a cheap trip. Um, but then in that case, that's paid by a grant, right? So I have a grant to do research. Grants to do research, typically you can, you include other costs, like the cost of publishing. I mean, paying page costs to publish in a lot of journals is, is something that you need, you know, money for, right? And so you would put that in the grant as well. Now, sometimes you're in a department or the college might offset some of that cost in order to help you publish because they want you to be able to publish. It's not just like coming out of your pocket. Um, although, you know, all of us at some point may have to pay something out of our pocket if we don't have the funds available to us, but we want to want to publish our work. Um, that's a whole nother situation there with publication costs in different journals and, and um, you know, how some of them, some journals really are scalping, you know, people and taking advantage of, of people. There's predatory journals out there. Okay, but we're not talking about journals. The ASA has a journal. It's not a predatory journal. I would happily pay the publication cost for that. Um, but uh, for these meetings, right, someone's got to pay for the organization, right, running the facilities and all that stuff. I mean, it's not cheap to do. And so there's a significant cost. And the cost has gone way up, just like with other things. I mean, over the last 15 years, the cost of going to meetings has gone up a whole lot. Uh, and so unless you have funds from your institution, like a lot of institutions will provide, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars per faculty member, maybe every, you know, sometimes every year if you're at an awesome institution that has is rolling in money, right? Or maybe it's like every couple of years they'll pay, help pay or pay completely or offset the cost of going to a scientific meeting because that helps you network and it helps the whole process of doing science. Uh, and maybe you're helping to take students, right? One of the most, one of the best things to do as a faculty member, one of the things I did many times was take a couple of students with me to a scientific meeting and they have a somewhat cheaper rate because we're trying to encourage you know, a new generation of scientists and so they can come in here and make, make connections as well. It's great to meet other faculty who maybe you're going to get a job with as a postdoc, right? So that networking is actually crucial. All of this is to say, as I've been saying, it's expensive. Right, so I'm showing you what the cost is here. You know, so if I was an early bird, if I did decided early enough to get in on the early bird special, right, as a member, which also means I have to pay the membership dues per year uh, to to be able to do that, then that's three hundred and sixty dollars. Or if I waited to the end, four hundred seventy. Now this is actually not an expensive um, registration fee. Right. Many of them have registration fees that are far, far higher than this. Um, so there's that registration fee. In this case, it was on the campus of the Catholic University of America, uh, and they had housing, basically dormitory style housing, if I, if, if I read that right. Um, somebody who was there can correct me. And I don't know what the rate on that was, but I mean, still could have been, you know, at least $75 a night, right? And possibly much, much more. I mean, this is Washington, D.C. Or if you didn't want to stay on campus, you want to stay in a hotel, you can just let your imagination run about how much that was going to cost in the summer, you know, in, in Washington or around Washington, D.C. Uh, and then they had a meal pass uh, if you lived, if you were basically on campus. And the meal pass is great because if you were on campus, of course, you're just increasing your network time, right? Because you're going to be eating all together in the cafeteria and then you just get a lot more time with others. And that's what I've seen pictures of. You know, I'm seeing seeing all these people I know basically sitting around tables in a cafeteria. Uh, and so every day it's like, here I have friends that are showing me the different people they're meeting and talking to. There, so when you, when you add up registration and then you tack on, you know, staying there for probably three, four nights, right? And food, all that's going to be, you, you're not getting out of there for, you know, under $1,500 um, to do that. Plus you got to travel there, right? So if you have to fly there, then that's that cost as well. And, you know, getting around and, you know, if you do any sightseeing, so it's, it's a substantial amount of money. And for me, it's, it's prohibitive. It is. I mean, it's just hard to, hard for me to justify the cost when, 
I'm not taking the family on a family vacation this year, right? Was, we we're not doing any trip. And I can't say like, well, yeah, but you know, I want to spend all this money uh, to go. Cause this would be 100% out of like my own money to go. And, um, it's, I wouldn't get, I can't get reimbursement. I, I work at a public institution. I can't, I'm not going to go to my chair and say, Hey, can I uh, use $1,500 out of the departmental budget uh, to go to this meeting for which, uh, you know, maybe if I give a talk, even if I gave a talk, is it a talk that's really something that would be uh, along the lines of something I am doing in terms of my research for, you know, my department of biology? Uh, probably not. Right. And, just yeah, you know, the reality of it also is I'm not going to get that money because no one in my department is going to get that money to go to that meeting. Like anyone who goes to a scientific meeting, uh, and just because of the department, just because of the budgetary woes of the institution I work at right now, um, there is no extra money for that. When I first started the job, uh, you know, I had basically a thousand dollar allowance. Like here's you know, everyone gets a thousand bucks to like go to a meeting or do you know whatever you you need to do in terms of professional service and development um but that disappeared after probably five or six years uh of being there and that's typical for a lot of places too um that have lost that kind of you know uh, money that allows us to do those kind of activities all right so i can't i can't i'm not going to get anything you know, I'm not going to get any grant. I'm not going to get any money from the institution for that. I not, don't have a grant that I'm doing research on that I could uh, use money from that. Like, say, if I had a National Science Foundation grant, all right, which I've had several NSF grants. And I have money in that for page costs and for travel and for, you know, collecting materials. And, you know, they got, I get the big light on, line on budget. Um, but even I can't spend that on travel to go to the American Scientific Affiliation meeting because that's a that's a Christian organization, right? And and what I would be talking about there isn't related directly to my work on the NSF project, and so therefore that that wouldn't be legitimate use of those funds, All right? So I don't have that source of money. So some of the people at ASA, um, you know. Well, I'll say a number of, of individuals at ASA. Uh, they work at, say, Christian colleges or professors at Christian colleges. So this is their networking time. This is their chance to do something in their professional area as Christians and go to a scientific meeting. Uh, and so they're getting university college funds in order to offset some of the costs for a meeting like this. Um, and others have grants and other, I mean, there's other things and, but I know there are many, many, many folks there who just find it so valuable that they're, you know, it's part of their, you know, personal budget because it's important and, um, and they might build a vacation around it, right? Like next year, it's going to be in, uh, Denver, Colorado or just outside Denver, Colorado. But I really want to go to that meeting partly because it's in Denver. It's a great location. Uh, Washington wasn't as attractive to me just because summer and it was really expensive. Um, but next summer, Denver, great. Love to go there. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to be making it um, next year to Denver either. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a slight chance I'll be able to make it. And if I am able to go, I will definitely work on trying to present something. The problem is I'm already committed to another um, <laughs> a speaking event, all right? All right, I'm already scheduled to speak. I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm still working on the dates here, but I think it's the day before this starts. Uh, and that would make it very difficult to get to Denver from where I'll be, you know, giving that particular talk. So I'm giving a science faith related, um, you know, invited uh, talk uh, next summer. So I already have that on the books. And then I saw the announcement coming out the ASA for next year is meeting like a week earlier than they did this past year. Because I was thinking, like, as I was watching, you know, everyone there was like, you know what? I'm going to make a real attempt next year to go because I could, I could probably wrangle um, taking some of my family out uh, to Denver. And there's definitely other things I want to do, right? I, I want to go to the Great Sand Dunes again and several other locations out there. So I'd probably work a family vacation 
around the visit uh, and make sure that my family has other things to do in that particular area. And then I would attend the meetings uh, for a couple days. I probably wouldn't have as much time as I would if I was by myself, but nonetheless, it would it would be worth it, right? I, I think there'd be, I would get so much out of that. I could I could work it into my schedule. Let's put it that way. But now, it's a week earlier than I thought it would be once they came out with this announcement, but they just did, uh, and I was really bummed out when I saw that. Um, so I don't think that ASA 2025 is in the cards for me. Anyway, I, you know, I just wanted to, I'm mostly making this for a, a, a quite a number of people that follow this uh, channel um, that I have known for many, many years, some of whom I've maybe not seen face to face for 10, 15 years. And probably 50% of the people that I know through this blog, through this uh, YouTube channel, uh, and through other interactions, but not face to face, I've never met face to face. Um, and so this world of being able to speak through a camera is great. It brings us together in ways that I never would have had before. But there's something about that, like, hey, I sit down with lunch with you and uh, finding out who you really are. Right. Uh, that's the interaction that I miss. And I need to and I'm, I'm, I'm making this video kind of to tell myself to remind myself, I need to try to make a way to for this to happen. Um, I need to find a way to get to more of these events. Uh, okay, so there's one other thing I need to say because I, I think I know somebody's going to say this in the comment section. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cut it off right now. Right, I'm gonna nip it in the bud. I'm I am not gonna start a Patreon channel, um, and I'm not starting a GoFundMe uh, to go to meetings. The funds were a limitation for me, um, but they're not that limiting, right? I, I, I can make this happen if the right circumstances occur. Uh, and I am not fundraiser, raising money person. This is a personal thing for me that I want to do. It makes me very uncomfortable receiving any money for, the, 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 uh, for this kind of activity. Um, and your support just by watching these videos, liking them, sharing them is like, you know, is worth more than all the money anyone could give me. I know that almost sounded dumb the way I said that, but it's like, I really feel that way. I do. Um, I mean, if, if you really want to give me a million dollars, you know, I probably would find some way to work out some kind of deal there, but, um, no, I'm good. All right, so, all right. Hey, all of you out there, ASA 2024, glad you had a really good time. Glad you made good friends and I missed you. Um, we'll find ways to meet someday. All right, with that, talk to you later. Bye-bye.